outside our window. And the birds are chirping all around in this happy little rural southern town. Hello and welcome to Rusty Water Towers, the podcast in search of faith and hope in rural life and ministry. I'm your host, Jonathan Lamaster Smith or as folks often call me, Dr. J. Each episode of the podcast, I talk with the guest about their experience in rural life and ministry as we search stories, examples, and images of creative faith and hope that I believe are latent in rural communities. Our guest today is the Reverend Shay Craig. The Reverend Canon Shay Craig is the vicar of St. Michael's and St. Andrew's Churches in Hayes, Kansas, and is the canon for congregational development for the Diocese of Western Kansas. I met Shay because I was working in my PhD at Garrett Evangelical while while Shay was working there in the church relations office. One of my favorite meetings uh, at run-ins with Shay was uh, when she found out that whenever she ordered enough office supplies, snacks came with it, and we got treats. And uh, me and the other guy working in there, we would sort of just pick out the treats we liked, but then somehow she found out that she'd get, get treats. So we had to share our Swedish fish with her and our uh, famous Amos cookies <laughs> as part of that. Um, well, my other favorite memory of Shay is that one one Christmas holiday, it was like two or three days before Christmas, I worked at the front desk part-time at Garrett while I was working on my degree, and Shay came down to meticulously record an outgoing message with all of the times that seminary will be closed. If you'd like to make a last-minute donation or find out any information, putting in the name and the number of the person to call, uh, all of, the, of this wonderful message. And then when I go to switch the uh, phone system over to the uh, outgoing holiday message, I delete it. So I have to scramble in the time that I need to, that I have left uh, working to re-record this uh, outgoing message as best I can. Thankfully, she had left her notes there. And for two weeks uh, during Christmas break, I was the voice of Garrett Evangelical uh, Theological Seminary. So that's that's uh, on my resume. Uh, if you ever if I if you ever, if you ever come across that, you'll see that there, voice of Garrett Evangelical for two weeks, and I believe 2013. <laughs> uh, so, uh, that, that is, that is one of my stories, uh, about her. We'll hear it. She, she is great to talk with. Uh, this may be my longest podcast episode ever because there's so much wonderful stuff to talk about. Um, but before that, I want to talk because each week I try to talk, talk about uh, a country music recommendation about rural life that helps us get going. So today we're talking about Willie Nelson. It, 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 it took me what, four episodes to get to Willie, four or five episodes to get to Willie Nelson. But here he is. But I'm not doing any of the classics that you might know about Willie Nelson, whether that's Mama Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys, On the Road Again, Always on My Mind. These classics, I want to talk about a brand new song off of his 2022 album. It's called A Beautiful Time. This song, when I was listening to it, surprised me. I don't even know how. Maybe I, sometimes you get in that mood. I just want to listen to Willie Nelson today. And I don't know why I did, but I found his newest album, beautiful album cover. And it's a surprising song that while on the surface is about a touring musician. But we know that country music is not designed to be taken always exactly literally, except for, except for a few songs. Uh, this, it, but it gives us something to chew on. Some of the lyrics go, if I ever get old, I'll still love the road. Now, note, this is Willie Nelson, who I think maybe in his late 70s, early 80s, singing, singing If I Ever Get Old. I'll still love the road, still love the way that, the, that it winds. When the last song's been played, I'll look back and say, I sure had a beautiful time. So obviously, Willie can sing about drinking and smoking all he wants. But he's someone who knows about living life and the realities of life and pushes us to examine what it means to live our lives. I mean, just the other songs I mentioned, Always On My Mind, Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up To Keep You Cowboys and On The Road Again. Solid songs that aren't just about a touring musician or a lost love. It's about ri the richness and beauty of life. He loves his job. You can tell he loves his job. He loves the music, the touring, the fans. I mean, he started Farm Aid and keeps doing Farm Aid over and over and over again. And he's worked for Liberation, maintained an outlaw status in a pop country world. He's done so much. And he's also done so much to help launch a bunch of what we might call outlaw or indie uh, country acts today, particularly women, as part of their work to make sure that they uh, get a, a voice in the country music world. So what I'm taking from this song uh, is a reminder that we need to live a life that, as we get old, still brings us joy and hope. A life that, as he says, when the last song's been played, we can say we had a beautiful time. I think it's important that he says beautiful. He doesn't say good or pleasant or wealthy. He... He's saying a beautiful life that includes that can include the pain, the struggle, the realities uh, uh, we face when the rubber truly hits the road. 
I mean, just knowing a little bit about touring for musicians, it's not easy. It's a lot of hard work. And if we translate that to our lives, we've all gone through things in our lives that are just painful and rough. But we can look back on them and say it's made us who we are, and it was still our lives have been a beautiful time. The hope is that we can still enjoy the drive, whatever that might be and at what age we are. I know that my life is nothing like I planned, except I think having too many dogs. I'm pretty sure I plan to have too many dogs at some point or another. And yet it's beautiful, and I wouldn't trade it for anything, and I could do this forever. At least I say that now. My back may change my mind later. Now, Shay, so getting to know you, I know you've had what you might call a beautiful life. I know you quit, you regularly post about your, your love of your life and all the different things you've experienced. So one of the things I do when I talk with our guests is I want, before they tell a little bit about themselves, I want them to share about how they've experienced this song and what it says to them. So I'll let you go ahead and share. I also was really interested in the use of the word beautiful because I live in a state that people drive through and go, God, it's so flat. I can't wait to get to Colorado, which is flat for the first two hours also, by the exactly, way. Exactly, yes. And it's and Kansas is not the flattest state. I've learned Illinois is the flattest state. So. <laughs> Illinois is flatter. Yeah. And, um, and if you were to get off the highway, which don't, don't get off the highway, stay on the highway. If you're driving from Kansas City to Denver, mm-hmm. don't get off the highway because Kansas's secret motto is keep going, nothing to see here. We don't need you to get off the highway. But if you did... <laughs> you would see how beautiful it is. And mm-hmm. e- but even when you live here, even driving on the highway where it's the, at its most flat and most inaccessible, there's so much beauty here. It's oh, so beautiful. Yeah. You have to know how to look at it. And that I think is a really important element of that song is knowing how to look at your life, having the context of, you know, yeah, I'm divorced and my kids are a mess or I lost all this money. It's still beautiful because I know how the how those gouges were made in the land, right? I look mm-hmm. out and I'm like, well, that is a field of Milo and it is beautiful. That is exactly the color it's supposed to be. It's gonna mm-hmm. come in in two weeks. That's great. Other people are like, gee, it's flat. I'm like, that's sorghum, baby. <laughs> that's beautiful. So knowing knowing what it is, is, is you know, it's like when you, when you love someone, you think they're beautiful. Right? Exactly. Not conventionally beautiful. But you love them. Mm-hmm. And so that that word was so perfect. Ah, yes, yes. It, it reminds me of people get so shocked by me because I, I have now learned that I, uh, so I went to a rural high school and I learned different, how to identify trees. And I can now, I can tell people from a distance in a car, oh, that's a post oak way out that in that field. <laughs> And they're like, how do you know that? Well, you can kind of tell the way the leaves are shaped and the way they hit the light and those sort of things. Like, it's a tree. And I'm like, no, it's a post oak. Post oaks are used for this and this. And you can tell that the leaves look like when you hold them up, look like a bird flying overhead and all of this all this fun stuff. And they're like, oh, well, I, I never thought about actually paying attention to the trees, uh, which feels like a Dr. Seuss uh, reminder to pay attention I, to what the trees I speak have. for the trees. <laughs> speak for the trees. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, anything else you thought about that song? I, I think Willie Nelson does such a good job of bringing words to us. Yeah, he's phenomenal. Mm-hmm. He's phenomenal. He just writes the most beautiful songs in the world. Mm, yes, yes. So, so thanks for th- so I'm gonna say thanks for sharing about that. I'm gonna include this song on our Rusty Water Towers playlist on Spotify. That'll be in the show notes. Uh, anything. Uh, so, if you'd like to recommend a song or for a review, a message us on social media or email us. So now, Shay, I want to give you the floor and share, share a little bit about yourself, your experience in rural life and ministry, what you thought, because I know you've lived in urban areas for quite a bit of your life. So I want you to share about that, too. All right. Well, I grew up in the suburbs of San Francisco in Marin County. Mm-hmm. So very high population, right on the water. Um, and then I spent my adult life in the city of Chicago or in Evanston, which mm-hmm. is a suburb of Chicago adjoining the city. So it doesn't feel like... A suburb, it feels like. Yeah, the, the, if, I, I was told by a friend, if the L runs there, it's still part of Chicago. Yeah, it is. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Except we'll met. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyway um, so I grew up, you know, I, yeah, I grew up with, with L's. I mean, I didn't need a car until mm-hmm. I until for a very long time. And um, I, you know, no, I was completely a city girl. I have a lot of, of still a lot of city girl habits and mm-hmm ethos. Um, but when I was living and working in, in Chicago, 
I, I, I received a call. I felt a call to come to Salina, Kansas. Ooh. Population, I don't know, maybe between 20 and 30, baby. Pe people or 1,000? People, oh, 20,000. <laughs> okay. okay. No, Salina is like the biggest city in our diocese. Oh, that's, that's yeah. Um, Dodge, Dodge may be bigger. It doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, Salina <laughs> is where I went to the cathedral, and I did a job there for two years. Mm -hmm. And then this job came open in Hayes. Mm -hmm. Now, Hayes, Kansas is actually, you've probably heard of it, because whenever anybody left Dodge City to go someplace else on, like, Gunsmoke or anything, they Ooh. were going to Hayes City. And that's, uh, that's amazing. Yes. For, we, for, um, so we're going to have to pause there to tell people, if, if you're listening to this and you don't know what Gunsmoke is, I don't know what to tell you. But, <laughs> but So Gunsmoke is the longest running, one of the longest running shows in history. And it is a like Western, radio first and then it, it, so it was a radio, uh, radio serial and then a television show that ran for decades. And it's a Western that takes place in Kansas. Uh, yes, and and one of the things I will tell you, look at Westerns differently if you've never watched Westerns. Well, this is the Wild West. This town, I mean, our sh our sheriff for a, a, a horrible couple of years or maybe a couple of months was Wild Bill Cody. I mean, this is the joint. This I is, love it. We are 100 miles from the geographic center of the contiguous United States. Oh. This is the heartland, baby. And, uh, and this is a college town. So we have a university here, a four-year university here. It's the only one in western Kansas that's a state university mm -hmm. that's... You know, it's called Fort Hayes State because Fort Hayes was here. Mm. Um, so the population of this town is about 17,000 when the students are here. Oh. Uh, and so it's the biggest city from here to Dodge, easy. Mm -hmm. And 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 the second, I think the second or third largest in the diocese. Mm -hmm. And the diocese runs from Salina to the Colorado border. Wow. So uh, the bishop said to me, that church has five people, five 70-year-old people in it. It's hemorrhaging money. Either it needs to close or, or it, so why don't you go out and decide if it needs to close? So close it, fix it or close it. Mm -hmm. You have three years. <laughs> okay, there you go. So, uh, so I came in July of 2020. Mm -hmm. It was a good time to do a church start. And we did a church start here. Um, I also, my second little church is a country church. It's a family church. They built it by hand oh, with, beautiful. with stone that they brought in on wagons mm -hmm. during the dirty thirties. There's a great, and now it's just a one room church. We don't have running water. We have, we have propane and electric, mm. you know, and those, those churches still exist. I think people need to remember that it's, it's, and now it's historic. Uh, you just, it's you a have to, box, right? you have to, and let, you like, know, it's not, and, and the graveyard has, of course, it has a cemetery on it. The graveyard ha tells the story of the United States, right? It tells oh. the story of people who homesteaded there in the 1880s, people who died of influenza the first time, you know, people who were mm. killed by, by, during a rabbit shoot, people who died in the dirty 30s, people who died in the war, tornadoes, fires. It's all in there. It tells mm -hmm. the whole story of the United States. Mm -hmm. Walk around that yard. So I'm going to uh, make you explain the Dirty 30s to us. I'm going to assume you're meaning the Dust Bowl. I do mean the Dust Bowl. Okay, yes, okay. Yes, the Dirty 30s, because, because Dirty 30s in other cities might be different. Uh, right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the real thing. The real Dust Bowl, um, okay. So the Dust Bowl mm -hmm. occurred uh, in, in the 30s. So we had the wild, tw the, the wild roaring 20s, uh -huh. which abruptly ended in 1929 with a the stock, the market. stock market crash. And... Rapidly after that, beginning in 32, I think, the really irresponsible um, farming practices of the Southern Plains states, so the mm -hmm. bottom half of Kansas, some of Missouri, not really much of Missouri, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. some of Texas, they had been just raping the land. And the mm -hmm. net of that was that the topsoil blew away. They had a lot of drought mm -hmm. and a lot of wind and the topsoil blew east. There is a wonderful, wonderful documentary by Ken Burns called Dust Bowl. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend this, in which you learn about people who, here in Hayes, who died in the Dust Bowl. So we're about the top line. We're about as top, the highway that runs through, through here is what they usually describe as the top line of the Dust Bowl. But we, mm -hmm. had, we had Dust Bowl here. And in fact, that little church, so mm -hmm. that little church is called St. Andrews. It's on the... Um, it's on the home, it's on a hillside. It's on the, really hard to get to. Mm -hmm. And we don't, you know, we don't gather if, if I can't get out there on my four wheel drive vehicle. If it's rained too much, we don't gather. That's that, life. That's a rule. I mean, that's rural, that's what rural ministry is. Um, 
they were putting that church together using stone from another building that had been hit by a tornado and some other stuff. Oh wow, that's 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 a cool story. They're using using what they had, they're using their stewardship. We have yeah. the stone, we have this wood, we can put it together. We can we can do this together, and we're all farmers. And we're going to do it when we can. And during the Dust Bowl, there wasn't a ton to be done. They couldn't really farm because yeah. they hadn't had rain in three years, literally. They were um, shooting and eating rabbits. They had big rabbit shoots here. Anyway. Um, rabbit is delicious if you've not had it, listeners. Oh, yeah. No. Meat rabbits. Oh. Another, another Hayes product. Um, anyway, so one of these guys, his last name is Joy. He's one of the original families. Um, he goes up to the church thinking it's a church it's a church work day and the guys are all going to meet at the church and do some church work. But he shows up and he's the only one there. Mm. So he was like, well, what the heck? I'm here. I'm going to hide. So he spent a Saturday working on the church and he goes home. And he discovers that he's the only person in the county who got rain. And he's like, y'all need to go work at the church if you want God to rain on your property. <laughs> That's great. That is great. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, that is beautiful. Oh. So I don't know what the question was, but that was a long answer. Tell us so, about how, where you are and where you live and what you do. That's, okay. You've done I that. Am, I am. Uh, I live in Hayes, Kansas in a vicarage. Uh -huh. Um that's part, that's the compensation that the larger church offers me. Mm -hmm. So and, um, and vicarage my, is parsonage in Methodist speak. I'm mostly Methodist, so okay. Uh, yeah. So so it's parsonage in sort of Southern Protestant speak. So if my church were financially independent, uh -huh. it would be I would be called a rector, and it would be called a rectory. Okay. But my church is not financially independent. I am bivocational, and so it, I am a vicar, and therefore where I live is a vicarage. So you are sent by the diocese as opposed to called by the church. Would that be the? I was called. I was sent with. I was sent with consent. Okay. I sat down with them because mm -hmm. there were five five old people. I mm -hmm. sat down with them and listened to them say what we all hear. All churches everywhere. We're old, we're tired, we want young families, we mm -hmm. want young families, we want young families. And this church had been sitting here with only supply priests and only supply priests. Mm -hmm. So he came in one day a week, three weeks a month um, for 10 years, 11 years. So I said, you know, this church is here because you guys have been rowing. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that this church is here is because of the grace of God and your hard work and you're tired. Mm -hmm. because you've been rowing, keeping it going. And that's excellent work. Mm -hmm. However, while the church is a boat, it's not a rowboat, it's a sailboat. Mm -hmm. And we need to let the Holy Spirit do the work. So let's spread a little canvas. But I did say to them, I'm completely alien to you, right? I'm, I'm a privileged, white, overeducated, middle-class, liberal yeah. dog lover from Chicago. I couldn't be more different. And so if you don't want me to come for any reason, you tell the bishop. And they were like, oh, no, we really want you to come. They didn't. <laughs> they totally didn't want me to come. But, you know, I mean, I was mm -hmm. going to come and live in the house and be there every week. And what could go wrong with that? And the other guy was retiring anyway. So, <laughs> so but now, now, now it's all good. Mm -hmm. So I was placed and by consent. But now I'm definitely, it's definitely a call. Like mm -hmm. they, they want me to stay for longer than I can possibly say. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that is wonderful. Cause I know that the Episcopal church is a slightly different system than the Methodist church does where yeah. we are yeah. mostly sent as unless there's a special circumstances. My aunt was a Methodist Bishop. She was the second female Bishop, my aunt, Judy Craig, Ah, uh, yes, my beloved aunt. So mm -hmm. she always said that her job as a Bishop was to be the steward of other people's talents, mm. which I kind of love. That is that is great. Is is Bishop in your future? No. <laughs> you have to be Although caught. I will say, I'll say this, Jonathan. There is a there is an organization in the Episcopal Church called Leading Women of the Episcopal Church or something like that. And mm -hmm. it's it's by invitation. It's a convocation by invitation. They call you for a week, and it is all the female bishops and all the cardinal parishes, the big parishes and mm -hmm. deans of cathedrals. And they talk, we talk. They oh, talk. Wow about what's the future of the church? Mm -hmm. What's the future of church for women? What is your role going to be? How can mm -hmm. we help to get your CV in order, get you skills that you need? Mm -hmm. What's your next job going to be? Ooh. And um, and I've been invited to that, but I'm really discerning. What does that mean for me? Because my call is manifestly rural ministry. Mm -hmm. So that means I'm never going to be a bishop. 
Nope. I, you know, at 35, I am the Cardinal Parish in this diocese. I mean, I'm never going to be the Dean of the Cathedral. Who wants to do that, right? Yeah. So what, what does leadership and future management mm -hmm. and, and an awareness of my gender, what does that look like? Like, I'm going to bring them a set of questions that they've never dealt with. Mm -hmm. That would be really interesting. That is fabulous. And I continue to be the advocate in my denomination area for the rural pastor. And we need to rethink how we do the rural ministry and create. So I, I do some work with some of the annual conferences because I am one of like three people in Methodism who knows the rural church exists. Uh, it's I'd say that if you're Methodist and you're listening, I love you. I just know, you know. And it's it's that reality. And some of our annual conferences are having to go to fully what we call a cooperative parish model. So there's no one assigned pastor for one church. It's multiple multiple elders, retired clergy, deacons in full connection. Uh, and so if you're listening to this and you're not Methodist, we have what we call the permanent order of the deacon. And it's, the, and it's designed to be people who are called to bridge the gap between the church and the world and in specialized ministry ways, whether it's conflict resolution, music ministry, social work, teaching, those sort of things. So we're working with that, certified lay ministers, lay servants, people who are just willing servants, we're having to mix it together because that's the reality of where the church is headed. And I think it's a much more historic and beautiful way of doing that, especially in rural places, because a lot of the rural churches, they're already so lay driven because that's their history yes. that they just need the pastor to be the pastor and to be the help them just sort of think and do. They want someone to teach them the Bible and they want someone to do that so they can keep going. Most of the churches I served want you to start working with them and letting the Holy Spirit get in there. Like, oh, we need a visitation team. Oh, we need, well, let's, let's go to the school and see how we can help mm -hmm. the school. Those sort of things. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not, you don't need programs. You need the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will create the connections that you need as part of that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. In our denomination, if you're listening from the Episcopal Church, it's because I told you to tune in. Because I have some other Episcopals, and the, I, I am I am I am branching out into the Southern Baptist, the Episcopals, the UCC. I am I am truly ecumenical with my work now. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh -huh. In the Episcopal Church, where uh, we're flyover, mm -hmm. I don't care. I, uh, I feel I I will tell anybody who will listen that I feel. I have been before I was before I came out here. I was the development officer for the Diocese of Chicago, which is a big wealthy thing. Mm -hmm. I know what it feels like to be acknowledged and recognized and loved by the larger church. Mm -hmm. That is not the feeling here. It's it's understandable. So I'm angry. I'm mad. Mm -hmm. And don't get me started because I will not stop. And so uh, I'm sure you're familiar with what the United Methodist Church is going through right now. Yes. There has, you know, there's the, there's the Global Methodist Church, which is breaking away as a more traditional conservative denomination. There's also you're a- You're so diplomatic, my friend. I am now teaching Global Methodist Church. Some of, some of the students are my students now. Um, the reasons a lot of rural churches are breaking away from the United Methodist Church is they distrust the denomination because they feel like they don't matter. And they would rather be more independent, which is sort of what the Global Methodist Church is. They've got a more congregational, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. connectional model. It's a mm -hmm. hybrid model. But there is also a large church, a large church denomination forming out of this. There's some of the large, like thousand plus member churches are breaking away because they just feel like the denomination doesn't care about them either. So I feel like our denominations have a problem all around with making their churches feel like they matter. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Now I'm going to be here for the advocate for the small rural church that doesn't have. Uh, mm -hmm. a $2 million budget. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking at a, a maybe a $50,000 budget, uh, maybe, uh, in some if of the it's churches. A good year. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I'm, in, I'm in a lot of, I know a lot of these rural churches, they don't have budgets. They have checkbooks and yeah. they pay what they pay. They can pay. They, uh, and they give a balance sheet. They don't give, they don't have like, we're setting up stewardship campaigns because if it's a bad year for the agricultural world, they can't, they're not going to be able to make their pledge and making a pledge in November is a terrible time for a farmer because no, that's, no, no, no. they don't know what the winter is going to be like, let alone the rest of the year. So mm -hmm. most of these rural churches don't do stewardship campaigns <laughs> the same way. So we're going to, so we've talked enough. We're going to take a short break and we're going to come back and you're going to tell us some of your stories. And I also know that maybe you work at, you work in stewardship a lot. So talking, maybe that'll be part of your story as well. Uh, so we're going to take a short break and uh, we'll be back after these messages. Hi there. Jonathan here, and I'm recording this ad to tell you about a resource from the Hinton Rural Life Center. My wife, Shannon, and I have partnered with Hinton to create the Theotokos Connections Confirmation Curriculum for small rural churches. We designed this curriculum with rural youth programs in mind. 
where you really want to connect their teenagers with the culture, heritage, and place on top of the faith you're trying to instill through the confirmation program. There are six sessions that focus on topics like connecting to self, God, history, church, place, and creation. Each unit has either a Bible story, like the story of Mary or the story of Samuel, or a historical figure like Richard Allen or Harriet Tubman to engage with as part of the experience. But this experience is not just a sit and listen and do a paperwork kind of confirmation. It's an active and connective confirmation program. You might be headed to a museum, helping prepare for a church spaghetti supper, learning new prayer practices, assisting in worship, or volunteering at the local mission agency. It is designed with rural culture and rural life in mind. You can do this in six weeks, six months, and you can do them in most any order or form you want to engage. And I'll tell you, I, I'm pretty sure it's not just youth programs using this curriculum. I've seen other people get it for their college ministries, as well as perhaps using it as adult confirmation or adult refresher on Methodist and rural culture and life. And you know, if you have other trusted confirmation curriculum you want to pair it with, go ahead. This is a very customizable program. So if you want to bring other lessons from a different program you've used or things you've written yourself, feel free to blend them in. This is also a very affordable program and you pay per student, not for a lump sum curriculum that you may not use all the pieces of, or you may not use but once every two or three years. And this is designed to make it affordable and accessible for you. And it pairs well with Hinton's Theotokos confirmation retreats that happen in the spring. For more information on the curriculum or to place an order, check out hintoncenter.org slash theotokos or hintontheotokos.org for more information. Thanks. All right, welcome back. Uh, so for this second half of the show, we're going to ask... Shay, to just share some stories, some experiences about rural life, where she's seeing hope, where she's seeing joy, where she's seeing the faith of rural life, the faith of rural life happening. Just so I'll just give the mic to you and let you talk. Okay. Well, St. Michael's Episcopal Church in Hayes, Kansas. Um, the, we Our informal motto is the church for people who've been hurt by the church. Um, one of the things I think that sort of has happened in the last 20 years out here is... Um, the growth of even of the evangelical movement. Um, that's our big, you know, the big church on the hill with the hundreds and hundreds of people. And then here in central Kansas, it's Catholic. Hayes, wow. is, 50, Hayes is 58% Roman Catholic. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, I've heard that. Kansas is very Catholic. Yeah, this is where they, this is where they came to go. Um, Missouri is Methodist and Kansas is Catholic. That's a thing we say. So we have people here who mm -hmm. have heard messages about the gospel and about Jesus that are hurtful or painful to them. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have survivors of clergy sex abuse. Mm -hmm. We have just survivals, survivors of toxic theology. We have um, a very, very strong gay community in my church. Mm -hmm. And we have people who have just been injured but, yeah. you know, I, I have people who, you know, for example, um, I have a person with limited mobility mm -hmm. who, you know, hearing that every single time that you're, that Jesus will heal you if you just pray enough. Yeah. If you have that enough faith. That alone leaves a mark on your soul. Mm -hmm. So this is a church for people who've been hurt by the church. Now, it's also because it's the Episcopal Church brand and because it was definitely a need in this town and because it's a college town, mm -hmm. we are the most active gay community in a church. We're mm -hmm. in the most affirming church in town. The ELCA is here and has a policy. Mm -hmm. The Presbyterians are right down the road, but they are churches full of people who are in their seventies. They don't preach a very progressive theology. Mm -hmm. They don't have, you know, we did a book group on Matthew Vine's God and the Gay Christian. Oh, we, we did a watch party about, I mean, we just, you know, we have, it's an active ministry for us. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, political we do have a Hayes pride which is political we're not political mm -hmm. this is just the theology of love and mm -hmm. and so my congregation is an active if they all show up on one Sunday it's about 65 people we're mm -hmm. usually worshiping about 30 um and I have people who are Trump loving climate denying gun toting yes even into the church people mm -hmm who sit and break bread and love and work and most importantly serve hand in hand with transitioning people, with out gay couples. Mm -hmm. You know, we're setting up to do a, a marriage between two women. 
Ah, yes. And we hold this space intentionally. It means having conversations with people about, look, I get that you're thrilled that you've discovered a, a church with liberal theology. You cannot come in here guns blazing. You cannot presume that the people sitting at your table believe the same thing for you mm -hmm. as you. Now, and that kind of leads me to my idea, my the hope statement, if you mm -hmm. will, for rural ministry, which is in a town of less than 20,000 people, mm -hmm. you have, there's real work to do here, right? There's people really have to work. This is a rural place. We work hard mm -hmm. and we live in small places and everybody is related to everybody else. Yes. And so you cannot let the little things get in the way. And the little things are, who did you vote for? Yeah. What's your position on the most recent, Kansas had a, had a, um, I guess I'm going to call it an abortion law vote. Yes. Um, what was your position on that? We don't, we, you can, we, yeah, it, we can't, we can't, can't dwell on that, that. Right. We can't let that get in the way mm -hmm. because we are, um, because it's our job to fix what's broken mm -hmm. in a literal sense and in a theological sense, right? If you, I don't know if you remember this, Jonathan, but when we lived in Chicago, you would drive down the highway and like a construction crew would be broken down and they'd be standing there looking at their phones and smoking, right? Mm -hmm. A construction crew in central Kansas breaks down and everybody mm -hmm. opens up the hood and tries to figure out what's going on and get it fixed. We got to get back on the road. This and there are me. people stopping by to help them if they can. Right? People pull up and yeah. say, I, you know, I got, I got a winch. Yeah. I mean, I once slid into a ditch with my sister who was visiting from New York. It, in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. rainstorm, slid into a ditch. She said, what are we going to do? I said, somebody's going to come along with a winch. She said, how do you know that? And before you know. I could answer, somebody came along with a winch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we fix things here. Yes. It's our job to fix things. So we have to set aside the small stuff to be able to mm -hmm. do it. That's what's hopeful. Mm -hmm. is that the long-term fix of the world, right? The tikkun olam, the healing what's broken in creation mm -hmm. is the priority. And here we know mm -hmm. that, that because we don't get along doesn't mean that we get to set aside what we've been tasked with doing. Mm -hmm. We have been tasked with fixing the world. If we don't agree on whether the chiefs are any good this year, that is BS. We don't mm -hmm. care. This is our job. And that is... That is what makes me never want to leave. Yes. Right? Because it's just, that's it exactly. That's the gospel. That so is, that's my hope statement about working out here, living and working out here. I, I love that. You're saying a phrase that I am not familiar with. Is it tikkun olam? Tikkun olam is Hebrew. Olam. Hebrew, okay. The con Yeah, my, my degree is in Hebrew Bible. Um, ah. <laughs> the, um, the concept is, I'm going to butcher this, but... Who's going to come for me? <laughs> I can't, I can't. You are you are you are now a folk theologian. You have you there's there's you are, you live in a rural space. You can claim folk theology. I'm folk, and, you know, there's only one exit. If they miss it, it's another hundred miles. So <laughs> they'll have fine. to come back. Yeah. <laughs> um, the concept is that uh, when we were removed from the Garden of Eden, creation was broken, mm. and our task from the Holy One mm -hmm. is to heal what is broken in creation. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. And that's how, in a from a from a Protestant perspective or a Christian perspective, that's how we arrive back in the garden in Revelation is by fixing what's broken, healing what's broken. Mm -hmm. Allah. Thank you, thank you. So that's that's very helpful. So it, it, so uh, John Wesley, of course, being a good Anglican, which I mean, you're Episcopal, so lived and died in my church, baby. Exactly, exactly. Uh, he uh, he has a similar language. He pulls from Ephraim the Syrian and said Ephraim the Syrian said that humanity's hope was shattered whenever they left the garden, and then talks about how to what, with the with the advent of Christ that allows us to folk, refocus our hope in one direction and heal our hope which means then we can deal, then heal the world. And he continues to say until, he says that, he says in one of his famous sermons, uh, The General Deliverance, is that as long as creation still suffers, we know that humanity is still broken. And until all of creation is healed, humanity has work to do. Yes. Right. We bring the kingdom one mm -hmm. action at a time. It's, it's beautiful. And it's, it, uh, we have, it, our, we, we, uh, our work is too important to argue about, argue about all these different things. <laughs> uh, it's, it's beautiful and, and you know one of so one of my uh parishioners mm -hmm. has 
has real conflict with, mm -hmm. with other of my parishioners and comes and speaks to me on the regular about this and mm -hmm. sits down and just says, you know, all right, I'm just going to, I got to, I'm going to get it out. I'm going to say it. We're going to, we're going to release it into the universe and it's just going to have to go because he says, I need to love this person, not with my personal love, but with the love that God has placed in me. Oh. So, it so it doesn't wear me out. Mm. Right? So we begin, that's that we do this session of his, which has a rude name, um, <laughs> by praying the prayer of St. Francis, right? Make me an instrument of your oh. peace. So that it doesn't drain us. It isn't our love that we're giving away. It doesn't belong to us to begin with. Mm. Which leads us, of course, then, this is a little off topic, to open table. To my certain knowledge, I'm the only church in, you know, for 100 miles in any direction mm -hmm. that has an entirely open table. You can come and take communion in my church, and I'm not going to ask you if you're for a, member, a baptismal self uh, certificate. I don't. It isn't my food. It isn't my table. Yes. Yeah. It you just my yeah, love. That's, that's my understanding of it within Methodism. You just have to be willing to be at the table where Christ is present. I don't, That's it. It's, not, it's, it's not my love. It's not my yeah. bread. It's not my wine. Mm -hmm. And you being Episcopal, you get to have wine. So that's nice. We do. Well, and, <laughs> and you know, when people ask me here, it's a big topic, of course, here that we're, that we have, we're the gay church. We're not just the gay church, but we are the, if you're looking for the gay church, that's us. Mm -hmm. um, people will ask me, are you the first church to, um, to marry to, I think it's to be welcoming to the gay community or something is mm -hmm. usually the question. And I always say yes, because Henry VIII, right? Why did he depart from the Roman Catholic Church? Because he wanted to marry somebody else. Mm -hmm. So that's the standard. We are the oldest. There may be others who, you know, would argue yeah. with me, but I'm going to go with the 1500s. So you wanted to marry somebody else. And some, some, they fell in love with someone that the church didn't want them to marry. Mm -hmm. So we made a church where you can marry a person you love. Well, that that is, is have you written that down somewhere? Is that published somewhere? No. <laughs> no. No, that's me being sarky to my Roman Catholic buddies. Oh, okay. Well, then <laughs> what else do you have for me on rural ministry? Oh, uh, the other things I have on rural ministry are a little rant about urban colonialism. Let's do that. I want that in here. Okay. Uh, when I took this job, I worked mm -hmm. for the bishop of the diocese of uh, Kent, of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And they were like, why would you live there? Why? You yeah. know you're going to find. And then they presented me with the usual stereotypes. And... Um, and that bothered me then, even coming into it from that. But now it makes me crazy because rural America, and, and I'll be interested to have your opinion of this, rural America has a culture and each kind of rural, you know, Appalachian rural versus Great Plains rural mm -hmm. has its own culture. If I'm going to send my youth group to South Sudan, right, mm -hmm. I'm going to train them up. This, you're going to hear this language. You need to take your shoes off when you meet, when you go into homes. Older people are referred to like this. You will hear gunfire, right? I yeah. get them ready and I say, I want you to be able to be respectful in that culture. Yes. People come down here from fill in your larger, your big city yeah. and they want us to be like them. What is the name of that? Yeah. Colonialism is yes. the name of that. And they just expect it, that the carpets will be rolled out for them and that yeah. And that we want, you don't have, you don't have a target. We don't want a freaking target. You can drive 110 miles that way and get a target. Go get your target. But we have $5 have generals. We, 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 we have those. Well, <laughs> you know, there's the rural, there's the rural town, town rural town starter pack, right? Yeah. Which is a general, a $5, like a dollar general and a pizza hut what? and something yeah. else. <laughs> uh, there's all, uh, yeah, uh, that, and there's the, that one chain gas station that's in your area. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Casey's. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I have had it. I've had, mm -hmm. I just, it's, it's colonialism. Mm -hmm. And, and when it happens on the part of your church, when your church says, well, it's time for you guys to do this training for this thing, um, that we don't have any of that here. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, like Hayes, Kansas is the, the, well, the census says we're 96% white. The school district is 98% white. Mm -hmm. Yes, everyone in my church has had anti-racism training. Mm -hmm. Did I really want to spend that money that way? No, I have no money. 
And my question is, was the anti-racism training geared towards rural congregations and rural no. communities? See, see, that's what no, I want. Not, if we're going to do any of this training, we need to we need to have specialists come in and say, let's have this conversation and make it rural. Because there's yes. different realities in rural spaces and there's yes. different experiences. Let's also have classism training and help people work with that. And let's also have, you know, let's have these trainings to help people in a way that is translated to them. Not just here is a blanket for anti-racism training and to, to, to engage with that. So this is a great segue to mm -hmm. why, um, why fundraising in rural places is different, specifically stewardship and, and major gifts. So there are basically four ways that we raise money in the church, right? Mm -hmm. We raise cap, we do a capital campaign for oh, a yes. thing, right? A thing. Uh, mission ministry or something having to do with our church, right? Yeah. We're raising it's often you know, a new church bus or a new roof, those kind of things. So that's a capital campaign. And generally people give from their savings mm -hmm. to this larger account, some mm -hmm. account to an account, right? It's mm -hmm. not, and then another thing we do is we do legacy giving. Mm -hmm. That is you create, you give some from your estate or from your will, you yeah. mention your church. And after you pass, you can give money that will essentially endow your pledge. So your pledge continues to be given. Oh, oh yes. And you can set it up to go to this event, this account or this account, or it can maybe property that's given in kind that they can then sell to use for this, that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's worth mentioning that legacy giving or planned giving is another word for that. That's going to go away. Once the baby boomers are dead, there aren't any generations that are going to have that kind of wealth. Yeah. Gonna, that, that kind of savings is just dead. not. Yeah. Yeah. So if you were planning on getting into people's wills, get right on that. Mm -hmm. The third kind of giving is a major gift campaign. Mm -hmm. This is where you have something that you're doing that has a big big dollar amount that you need, but it isn't as big as a capital campaign. So for mm -hmm. example, we need $30,000 of repairs on our organ. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do that by asking, strategically asking certain people yes. to give an amount to add that up, right? Mm -hmm. um, but again, that is from their savings mm -hmm. to a specific thing. Mm -hmm. Stewardship is another animal entirely. Yes. So stewardship you give from your daily nut, right? You give mm -hmm. from your weekly or monthly budget. It's a line item in your budget. It comes out of your paycheck. Mm -hmm. and you give it every week, every month, however often you can. So, so like for me, I, I I have mine come out the first day of the month. I have an auto draft to my church and to the other organizations I give to. They leave exactly. the first two to three days of the month because that's when my bank account is the highest. So that's the nature of stewardship. But the mm -hmm. theology behind stewardship is also different from mm -hmm. those other categories. And the... Um, the equation I use for this or the scripture I use for this is the very wealthy young man. So mm -hmm. this appears in the canonical mm -hmm. five or in the, um, the three, not John, mm -hmm. um, a wealthy young man or a prince mm -hmm. approaches Jesus and says, um, I'm keeping my commandments and doing the best I can. What else must I do to enter heaven? Mm -hmm. And Jesus answers him. Jesus looks at him and loves him. It says, this ah, is beautiful, he right? Looks yes. at him and loves him. And then he says, you must give away your wealth to the poor and come and follow me. But the reason he says this mm -hmm. is you can give away your wealth and follow me. The reason he says is not, I got these 12 guys to feed uh -huh. or uh, I'm going to build a basilica in Rome. Mm -hmm. The reason he gives is in order for you to be complete, telos, mm -hmm. in order for you, Jonathan, yes. to be whole, you must give away your wealth. This is not about your budget uh -huh. at your church. It is not about paying your priest or pastor. It is not about getting the yard mode. Mm -hmm. This is about your relationship with God, which is not complete until you can give away the golden calf. We've been at this for 2000 years and more. Mm holding on to that calf, right? The minute God, the minute we lose faith in God, we, we build a golden calf. With what? With things that God's already given us. Yes. All God is saying is, be able to open your hand. That's what stewardship is. So it isn't to your budget. So mm -hmm. it isn't. It there isn't a proportion. There isn't. There is. There shouldn't be a calculation mm -hmm. because it isn't about your budget, mm -hmm. right? It's about this conversation. Yes. And 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 Christ gives to us sacrificially. Mm -hmm. So the question I always ask people is, you're giving, you're generous, thank you. Is it sacrificial? Because mm -hmm. that's the standard. That's the following Christ part. Mm -hmm. 
So, so what does that look like in, in rural ministry? That's an awareness that, as you say, you can't collect money if you had a fire and lost 200 head and the calves that came in the next season scored under two, which is a cattle thing. Yes. The calves came in thin. Okay. So mm -hmm. you lost 200 head, you lost the, all that pasture land and your calves came in thin. Yeah, you're gonna be getting just barely getting by that year if you do that. You know, you what you give, what you give to the church is yeah. showing up not sobbing. That's great. Right. <laughs> Fully you know? closed. Yeah. And um, right, exactly. <laughs> and in that year, when our people give to church, they're mm -hmm. knowing they're giving, knowing that that money's gonna go right back out the door to those people. Yes. So mm -hmm. there's that, mm -hmm. and then there's the fact that um. In my churches, and this was a learning for me, in mm -hmm. my churches, um, they are so aware that everything they get comes from God, right? You plant mm -hmm. that seed in the ground, and it's you and God until it comes up. Mm -hmm. And not just comes up, but harvest, right? You can get a hail, we could get a hailstorm in, in that Milo I mentioned. We could get a hailstorm in that Milo, yes. and it would be fine. But, you know, we could use the rain. So... Their theology of giving, their theology of money, their theology of money is so brilliant and deep that when I do a stewardship campaign here, I do it in Advent so that we walk forward our commitments and we call them commitments because we're hoping, mm -hmm. right, that this is how it's going to work out and we'll be able to realize this. Yes. We walk up our commitments and place them on, on Three Kings Sunday, right, on Epiphany. Yes. When the kings bring their gift forward to the Christ child, we bring our gifts forward as well mm -hmm. because the theology is more important than the budget. Is it hard to make a budget? Heck yes, but it's hard any time of year. So take the time to embed it in the budget or in the in the mm -hmm. liturgy, in the theological premise of your yeah, congregation. Yeah, make it spiritual, not material. Exactly. My congregation is largely cattle-driven and academic. So that epiphany is really good. If I had a more um, more of a farming community, if we were doing, uh, then I would probably do it in the fall because that's harvest. You could do that. I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll Hallow's Eve, the celebration of the harvest. So just so, have you written this down somewhere? So yeah. that it's good because I would love well, that. To, that needs to be put out there. <laughs> have I written it? Yes. Yeah. Has it been read? Mm, <laughs> see above, redheaded stepchild. Well, see, I would love to get you somewhere where you could teach this in it, because obviously it's 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 not just Episcopal theology, it's Christian theology. So any Christian church could take this and let's make our make it work like in ways that make sense for our community. Not everyone should be having their stewardship campaign from October fifteenth to November fifteenth. No, it, and and don't buy a pre made scholastic book fair scholar, you know, stewardship <laughs> campaign with posters that have like pictures of little lambs and you write your date don't don't do that that's uh -huh. horrible i want to i just that's horrible i want to stab you in the throat <laughs> yes yes that that's an important that's an important theological statement right there <laughs> <laughs> yes that's perfect perfect yes yeah, so yeah yeah do something that makes sense for your church like write write any of your things that make sense for your church it's a little harder if you're doing that because you're not buying copy and paste curriculum but it's going to be more meaningful when they come together to put it together themselves. And just do, you know, do it in whatever is the ethos of your church, right? My church is a big party church. Our, our language of love is food. Well, you're a so, rural church. Right. And thank God too. <laughs> right. But um, so when we come together to celebrate this, we just have a party mm -hmm. and we are thanking each other for our generous gifts. We are thanking God for the lights and the spaghetti mm -hmm. and the, in the sauce and each other, that, that is stewardship. Mm, that is beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, that, that is beautiful. I think about this a lot. Good, good. I mean, that's important. I mean, that's, I mean, you come from a development background into rural communities. So how do we do it in a way that makes sense there and doesn't cause harm by, you know, getting yelled at that you're not paying your denominational askings and these sort of things, and getting, we're not shaming the congregation for the fact that, yeah, because I feel like sometimes denominations uh, shame their congregations who don't pay the right pay their amount mm -hmm. into that, uh, and uh, and it's oftentimes they'll they'll be like, well, these little small churches don't pay. 
oftentimes it's the small churches who make the sacrifices to pay their denominational askings be- before the larger churches will. Because it's an ethic. Because mm-hmm. it's not about it's not about a budget. It's about an ethic. Mm-hmm. And you know, you know, if that's if it's bought, if you know, if our two big churches that have big numbers, mm-hmm. if it's really bothering them that the smaller churches are not doing their bit, uh-huh. pay it for them. Right. Adopt them. So if if it's bothering you, yeah. fix it. Yeah. That's the way we roll. That's how we fix what's broken. If it's broken, fix it. In fact, this coming weekend mm-hmm. is Lazarus. If you're if you're doing the common lectionary, which you know you guys have the option of the neg of the narrative lectionary, which is very cool. But um, we still have the RCL. We we do that. We do that, but it's slightly modified. So I've got the parable of the shrewd uh, investor or something. No, the, shrewd, the, the 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 wicked steward or something. Oh, you've got no. You're right. This is wicked steward. I'm just not preaching. <laughs> oh, okay. So the next time you're preaching, you've got Lazarus and Dice. I'm yeah. preaching. I've got Lazarus and, and the, the rich wealthy man. man yeah. Right. Which is a lot about if can we if we if we ignore people who the invisible suffering, uh-huh. right? Are we dismissed from our responsibility? Mm-hmm. No. No. Well, no. It's too easy to no. You can't be dismissed from your responsibility if it's bothering you that the smaller churches can't make their payments. That doesn't dis, doesn't dismiss you from responsibility. You're you're resp- that's your mm-hmm. brother. Do the do the brother keeper thingy. Mm-hmm. No, you know, Jonathan, I have people who are raised raising up to be priests here. They're discerning to the priesthood and they're attending seminary. Mm-hmm. Um, in a leader in a in a rural place to be rural leaders. Mm-hmm. That's a hopeful sign right there. That is, that is so important. They'd say you are called to rural spaces. I know it's an auditory thing. Yeah, but I am barefoot in blue jeans on a Thursday morning. Yeah. Is, I was never doing that in the Diocese of Chicago. That didn't no, happen. no. That didn't happen in on the Gold Coast at all. Yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. And I know that you've really gotten into cowboy boots since you've been down there, so that may not be appropriate in other places. We have snakes here, Jonathan. <laughs> we have those where I am too. I have that's, why, I have, we have, cow- that's yeah. why we have cowboy boots. We have at my little rural church up here. Um, right when I first got up there and I was just trying to like, I mean, it took me a, a while to dig in and get their confidence. They were like, who are you? And blah, blah, blah. I was, I drove up there in my Ford F-150 and um, I had on cowboy boots and this bull snake, which is harmless. Bull snakes are harmless. Oh yeah. This big though, like, 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 like six inch diameter. Um, come sliding out of the church. And we had been talking about the fact that this house, I told, or this church I told you has no water, so they have an outhouse. Mm-hmm. And we had pack rats in the outhouse and they were building up the bottom because they were making their little home. So, you know, it was getting kind of tight in there and they were trying to figure out what to do with, with the pack rats. So and yeah, so if you're listening, pack rats are a real thing. They're not just a, not oh, yeah. just a euphemism or a- No, they're a, vermin. Not, not a, yeah, they're vermin. They're vermin, and they and they create a little nest that was elevating the bottom of the of the outhouse such that it wasn't what was whatever stable? you dropped in the hole didn't go very far. Oh, okay. And so I said to this lovely man, uh, Dennis, why don't we put the snake in the outhouse? Won't it eat the Won't it eat the pack rats? And he goes, Mother Shay, that's the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> But I did learn on that day that I need to wear my boots every single time I go up there. <laughs> that, that's true. And I, there's also the story, remember, remind, I've always been reminded that to whenever you go to an outhouse to check the toilet seat because black widow spiders have a, have a tendency to build in the toilet seats. We have tarantulas. Oh, oh, I forgot. You're, further, so much you're, so. you're much further west than I am. <laughs> yes, west and south, right? Yes. Because when I drove down to Dodge, there were a whole bunch on the road. Um, no, but here's my favorite story about the outhouse. <laughs> there was a bishop here in this diocese who is not our current bishop, who we love very much, and not even the last bishop, who we loved very much. But there is a, a mythical bishop, a, a legendary Let's imagine bishop. it was a bishop. And yes. he came to do a visitation at St. Mm-hmm. Andrew's, my mm-hmm. church. And they, you know, they rolled out the red carpet. They had a big picnic outside, and they blah, 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 and it was yada, yada. And uh, he disappeared. And they were like, what happened to the bishop? And then they realized that somebody's car alarm had been going off for a while. He'd gotten locked in the outhouse and nobody had noticed. <laughs> so I don't go in that outhouse ever. <laughs> you just told it. <laughs> no, yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's an outhouse every mile, right? Every section line is an outhouse, baby. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, yeah. So this is just, oh, gosh. 
Well, Shay, this is this has been a fabulous conversation. Well, I'll send you. I'm going to send you a link to Project Resource, which and I can is, I can put that in the show notes. Yeah, okay. which is the Episcopal Church offering for stewardship, and then I am the faculty member for that for rural churches. Fabulous, fabulous. So, what, are you willing to talk to people who are not Episcopal? Yes, you can't come to the conferences, but I can absolutely advise people. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, ex excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So the last thing I normally do with my guests is ask them, what have you brought to share with us? You've already shared so much with us about the that sort of thing, but what, what piece of media, music, books, movies is really giving you hope right now? So you turned me on to a book called Rural Voices, mm -hmm. right? Is that what it's called? Yeah, Rural Voices, and it's yeah. a hard, little hardback book, blue cover, edited volume. That's it. And it's a collection of stories of young people mm -hmm. in, in rural spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a congregation, and, and a lot of it is about gender inequity and um, bias, various kinds of cultural bias. Mm -hmm. um, and I have, uh, and what was a little bit spooky about it is one of the story. In one of the stories, there's a group of kids in a McDonald's um, who gather in that McDonald's to do their homework because it has strong Wi-Fi. And uh, right, that, the unhealthy breakfast club. <laughs> Unhealthy Breakfast Club, that's right. Yeah. Um, and we had just, my church had just put, um, or just begun to talk about putting Wi-Fi in the two coin-op laundries in town Ooh. as just a gift, right? Mm -hmm. You're sitting here anyway, do your homework. Um, and so I, that gave me the chills. And mm. um, But that book really opened up for me, because I didn't grow up rural, what the experience is in them inside the minds of people with whom I don't necessarily have a great deal of contact or, you know, I have a youth director, I have a youth group, I have a youth director, but, um, but they don't talk to me about this. And it's, and it's not, it's a person, it gave me perspective and it mm -hmm. gave me um, something to hook onto. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, and the thing I kind of loved most about it was that it, it had a tendency to go into um, mythical realism you know, things were yes. a little spooky. And I was like, that is totally how it feels to live in the world <laughs> right now. I feel like we have a bison herd here in town in Hayes and we have white bison. And people say, you know, people believe special things about those white bison and they believe them and, and it, therefore it is true for them. Mm -hmm. So mythical realism is a thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's oh. and it's beautiful and it's 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 reality. It's for people. It's it's we can't. It's you can't go into a, a rural space and tell them that their their legends and their stories are not of value. Well, it's their gospel. It's a it's a it's a testament, right? Yeah. This is this is the framework. This is the um. What I want to say here. This is the framework. This is the infrastructure on which we hang the experiences of our lives to make sense of them. Mm. And, yes, and, and you're not, and that's for me. Obviously, for me, it's the Bible. For them, it's some of this. And I think that's totally that's that's a reality, and that's beautiful. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. So I, that's a great book. Everybody should read that book. I've bought it four times and given it away. I currently don't have a copy. <laughs> it's actually it's actually really fairly affordable most of the time when I've looked on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything anything else you want to share with the group before we close out the podcast? This has been fun. You and I should talk more often, obviously, because we're a little went on a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So if you're if you're listening, we actually talked for about forty five minutes before we actually press record. <laughs> so now that now that we're here, I, now that we're at the end of the podcast, uh, because we do need to close out eventually. Uh, is there any way our listeners can find you? You said you're going to put the uh, the website. You're going to give me the website for Project Resource. Is what it's called? Yeah, it's project resourceorg dot uh, org, and yeah. then. Um, you can find me at St. Michael's Hayes, which is just what it sounds like, stmichaelshayes.org. Uh, uh, .org? .org. Uh -huh. That's our little website. Perfect, perfect. Reach out to her at stmichaelshayes.org uh, on their website. And uh, so uh, look for that. Uh, and again, Shay, thank you so much. Like you said, we need to talk more because this, is, yeah. this has been fabulous. This uh, is fun. And being here with me on my Rusty Water Towers podcast, uh, so uh, you can listen to Rusty Water Towers wherever you get your podcast. If you have questions, suggestions for guest topics, or just want to say hi, you can reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, or you can email us at rustywatertowers at gmail.com. Special thanks to Shannon Lemastersmith for our theme music. I record and produce this podcast because I believe that we can lift up the hope and faith of rural life through this kind of work. Thanks for listening.
live across the railroad tracks in the little lighthouse that you pass if you weren't trying to find me. Many of the trees are dead, there's stumps in the ground in a great big yard across from the fire station. Oh. 